Good morning, everybody. Today, we are doing chapters 10A and 10B about biotechnology. Good morning, Bella. How are you? OK, uh, we may get some more folks. If not, uh, glad to hear you well, Bella. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started, and uh, the folks who are joining later will uh, pick up where they come in. All right, here we go. 10A, biotechnology. There we go. All right, DNA technology. So what are we talking about here? We are talking about strategies and technologies that allow scientists to change the genes inside of individuals. So recombinant DNA technology is a set of techniques for combining genes from different sources into a single DNA molecule. So for example, you could put a gene for glowing in the dark from jellyfish into mice, and they've done that. That's recombinant DNA. An organism that carries recombinant DNA is called a genetically modified organism, or GMO. So when you see, see that those three letters, GMO, it means genetically modified organism. Recombinant DNA technology is applied in the field of biotechnology. So biotechnology basically means uh, modifying living organisms to do some particular job that people want. Biotechnology uses various organisms to perform practical tasks. The most common organism that's used is bacteria. So please try to remember bacteria are the main organisms used in biotechnology. Okay, so I may ask you to be able to tell me about this figure. So I'm going to go through it with you. It's potentially an essay on an upcoming exam that includes this chapter. So take notes. I remember if you're re-watching this, you can pause, take notes. Please do not try to find something off the internet and copy that because it won't be worth anything. So let's go through it. Okay, so what we're starting off is with a host cell. This is a bacterium. Notice the uh, kind of hot dog shape. This is something like E. coli or a similar rod-shaped bacteria. And the DNA inside is other different than ours because it's circular. If you remember, we talked a little bit about that. I think we've already talked about that. If not, we will be talking about it soon. Bacteria have circular chromosomes rather than linear ones like us. Okay, so the cell that contains the gene of interest. So let's say, for example, this is a human gene or an animal uh, cell. And the gene here in yellow is the gene of interest that we want to propagate or multiply. So what they do is they clip this gene out of this individual cell, and they put it into the chromosome of the bacterium. So the recombinant DNA is the host DNA, which is blue, and the gene of interest, which is yellow. So now it's in there. So what happens now is two possible things that can happen to this bacteria and what does. Because the gene is in there, it's going to be used to produce protein. And so as the, as the uh, bacterium multiplies, all the new bacteria are also going to have this gene, and they're going to be producing these pink proteins. So each of these pink circles is the protein that's the result of this gene being in there. So the cell multiplies and produces the protein. In addition, as the bacterium multiplies, it also is multiplying or replicating that DNA inside of its cells. So there's two possible outcomes. You can either take the genes that have been reproduced by in these bacteria and insert it into a, a plant. So for example, you could have a gene for pest resistance inserted into plants. Now the question is, why would you want to do this? Well, I don't know if you guys have been hearing, but Roundup, which is an anti-weed uh, product that had been used for years and years, is now uh, in, under a class action lawsuit because people who have been using uh, Roundup for long periods of time have been getting sick and getting cancer. So the question is, well, what do we do if uh, you don't want to have Roundup for weeds or you don't want to put pesticides on the corn to prevent organisms from eating it? And we'll be talking about what kinds of things would eat corn. And corn is interesting because it's in almost all of our food products. Almost everything that you find that's processed, you know, that's like in a box or a bag or something like that, has some corn product in it. So if you don't want to spray... Um, and by the way, one of the genes you could put into corn is a, it's what's called Roundup resistance. And that is you can spray Roundup, which kills you know, all kinds of plants. But because this, this uh, corn has a gene, 
that makes it impervious to Roundup. You can just spray the Roundup up and it kills the weeds that would steal the nutrients and water from the corn. But more importantly, we don't want to eat pesticides on our corn. So what you do is you put a gene into the corn and, uh, and that makes it resistant to the pest. That means when the pest eats it, it dies or it tastes terrible to the pest. For example, worms or whatever. Now the question is, if there's now some kind of chemical that the gene causes the plant to produce in the corn that's making it less you know, interesting to the bug, what does that do to our health? So there've been several, uh, several um, ballot initiatives, especially in California that uh, are asking um, the state to make sure that producers of food label anything with GMO in it. And so what the food companies have said, and they were successful at making sure that this law did not pass because it would cause people to buy fewer uh, food products that contain corn that is genetically modified. So what they said is, hey, everything's already labeled. And what they meant was, if you have a product that has uh, only non-genetically modified corn in it, it will say GMO free on the label really big because they want people to buy that. So what the food companies were saying was, hey, you can assume if something contains corn, it's genetically modified, unless it says GMO free. So they're kind of coming at it backwards. Instead of warning people off, they were saying, hey, people will always, companies will already put a label that says uh, it is GMO free on it. And so we don't need this. And what their threat was to the voters was it'll make food more expensive. And they won because they have millions of dollars. And so this ballot initiative did not pass. Okay, so that's one thing that you can do with these genes, put it in to plants. Now, you could also harvest uh, if this was a different gene. By the way, this is not the exact same gene. But if this gene caused a protein to be made that dissolves blood clots when people have a heart attack, you could make lots and lots of this protein in big vats by the bacteria just making it. And this is not something they would normally make, but because you inserted the gene for a um, fibrinolytic, it's called fibrinolytic uh, enzyme, that breaks down clots that could uh, help people with heart attacks. So this is one way that you could do it. So there's a possibility that this figure here will be on the test. And I'll ask you to tell me as much as you can about it. Use what I've told you and what may be in your text, but do not grab stuff off the internet. Now, take a look at this figure. Now, this is a figure from a more recent copy of the book that I used to use. It is not from your book, but you can probably see why I haven't used this. And it is very similar to the previous figure. It just has a lot more detail. And in my experience, if I give students a really complex figure to explain, they get confused, overwhelmed, and they just kind of shut down. So you can see this is basically the same thing, but instead of having just one gene, they have three separate genes, three separate bacteria, three separate things. And then there's all kinds of other things you could do. You could make blue genes, you could heart attack therapy, you can clean up oil spills, or you can pest resistance. So what they did was they took that previous figure and elaborated on it. But if I ask you, it'll be this one because it's simple. I just wanna know if you understand how it works, okay? okay. Uh, this one is talking about from humulin to genetically modified foods. Okay, by transferring the gene for a desired protein into a bacterium, proteins can be produced in large quantities. And that was the purple circles that you saw in the previous figure. Now, this is a really interesting molecule. In 1982, the world's first genetically engineered pharmaceutical product was produced, and it was called a humulin. Now, what is humulin? Well, look at the label. It says insulin human. So this is human insulin the people who have diabetes would need to inject so that they can get sugar from their blood into their body cells. That's one of the things that's a problem for diabetics. Now, back in the day, they used to extract cow and pig insulin out of the blood of slaughtered pigs and cows and put that into bottles. The problem were twofold. First, it was fairly expensive because you had to extract it from dead animal blood, not the best way to do it. Second, it's pig insulin, or cow insulin, which is not exactly the same as human insulin, and they sometimes had adverse reactions. So what the pharmaceutical industry said is, hey, why don't we make actual human insulin, have bacteria make it for us, 
And then we'll harvest it in large quantities and then we can sell it inexpensively. Well, that was until people like Farmer Bro, Martin Shkreli got a hold of these pharmaceutical companies and decided to use uh, the fact that people absolutely had to have this insulin to make a lot more money and made a lot of pharmaceutical uh, products that had been fairly inexpensive, a lot more expensive. That's a different topic, but should pharmaceutical companies gouge people who are often poor and can't afford the medicine because they can? Uh, one of the downfalls of uh, capitalism, in my opinion, uh, but that's a separate topic. So Humulin used to be really inexpensive until these young, greedy execs got a hold, and then it started to go up. And then we're, we, I could also talk to you about EpiPens, but that's a completely separate topic. Okay. So Humulin, which is human insulin, by the way, that's a portmanteau. So uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard of uh, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez. And then you merge those together because they were a couple for a while. It's called Benefer, and that's called a portmanteau. When you take two words and kind of mush it together as one. So the portmanteau here is human insulin or humulin. And so it was made by genetically modified bacteria because it was so much better and so much more inexpensive. The FDA approved it and a lot of people have been using it. Okay, so this shows you bacteria growing in these huge vats. And then this system here is extracting the material that these bacteria are producing. And uh, there you go. All right. I don't believe this is in your notes, but this is, uh, this is a little bit of... Um, additional information that you might need. DNA technology is used to produce medically valuable molecules, including human growth hormone or HGH. EPO, which stimulates production of red blood cells, you could use this EPO to blood dope, which is um, illegal and immoral, and vaccines. And this is one of the ways that we get vaccines uh, is through uh, these genetically modified organisms producing the vaccine in large quantities. And that's how we have it now, for example, for things like COVID. Okay, prior to the development of humulin, diabetes was treated using insulin from cows and pigs, slaughtered their blood, extracted. These types of insulin can cause adverse reactions in recipients due to the reaction of the immune system. So just a standing request, a suggestion, you know, what you need to do is if there's ever a slide that doesn't correspond to part of your lecture notes, just take it as an FYI, something that you should know, but is not likely to be on the test because the review questions are based on the notes and the test questions are, are based on the review questions. So it's something you should know, something you could use in one of your answers, uh, but may not necessarily be something you need to wor worry about. So the point is, if you see a slide that doesn't correspond to something in your notes, don't freak out. Just um, take a few notes on it and know that it's not likely to be on the test. Okay, humulin was the first recombinant DNA drug approved by the FDA, and many more have been since then. Okay, genetically modified foods. So I was talking to you guys about genetically modified corn. Today, DNA technology is quickly replacing traditional plant breeding programs. So what do we mean traditional plant breeding programs? Well, it used to be the case that if you had one particular kind of corn that had some feature that made it really appealing, and another kind of corn that had another feature that made it appealing, what you did was you took pollen from one and put it onto the female part of the other plant, and what came out were called hybrids. And that was how they got corn or whatever plant to kind of move in the direction that they wanted to do. Now, that requires that there has to be a plant that already has this feature that's similar enough to the one that you've got, and then you breed them together and you get a better one. That takes time. When you have a particular gene from whatever organism and you put it into the plant, well, you just instantly have your fix. As long as the plant, A, will use that inserted gene to make the protein that you want it to make and have the effect that you want. And secondly, what if putting that gene in there causes problem in terms of the food no longer being safe? That is an issue that we've been struggling with for decades. In the United States today, roughly half the corn crop and more than three quarters of the soybean and cotton crops are genetically modified. If you want to learn more about this, how this uh, affects us as consumers and the food industry, there's a movie that came out about 10, maybe a little bit more than 10 years ago called Food Incorporated, Food INC, Food Inc. 
And it talks a lot about the company Monsanto and how they own the patents to these genetically modified seeds and they prevent farmers from planting anything other than these seeds. The farmers have to buy, they're on contract to buy these seeds. And so it's just a way of kind of extorting the farmers. So if you're interested in that, uh, please watch the movie Food Incorporated. It should be available somewhere free online. All right, so this is another uh, kind of FYI slide. Uh, strawberry plants produce bacterial proteins that act as natural antifreeze, protecting the plants from cold weather. Normally, you have to grow strawberry plants under these plastic kind of uh, covers to prevent the frost from getting to them. But if you put this protein in there, then you don't have to worry about covering them in the winter so that you can continue to get strawberries throughout the year, especially in the winter. Potatoes and rice have been modified to produce harmless proteins. We'll notice they put the word harmless in there. We don't know for sure derived from the cholera bacterium that when one day serve as edible vaccines. Well, cholera causes severe problems. So that's something you wanna be really careful about. Um, edible vaccines from the cholera bacterium, depends on how they do it. But one of the things that you should know is generally things aren't brought onto the market, especially from the FDA or from the government, unless they've been really well tested. Now, to dovetail on something I talked about earlier, Yes, the uh, COVID vaccine that was produced through this genetically modified process was pushed through more quickly to save lives. It doesn't mean that it's unsafe. Just because it's a new technology and less time to test it doesn't mean that it is unsafe. The must, much of the testing was done using computer simulations, uh, lab animals, and actual people. But normally vaccines take years and years and years to develop, but you know people were dying. Hundreds, thousands of people were dying of COVID, so they fast-tracked it, and so far there haven't been any significant widespread problems with the COVID vaccine, according to anything that I've read, unless you're going to a conspiracy theory blog or some so-called news networks, um, there haven't been any significant problems with any of the COVID vaccines yet. All right, so let's go on with this. Corn has been genetically modified to resist insect infestation. So what they used to do was spray corn with pesticides, which is a chemical that kills pests, mostly insects. Well, the problem with pesticides is now it's on your corn and when you eat the corn, you're eating the pesticides and it could and does potentially and adversely affect your health. So this non-genetically modified corn has been damaged by the European corn borer and it bores a little hole and obviously you wouldn't eat that if you saw that at the store and farmers know that you're not gonna buy it. So they had to do something. So it's either uh, grow it organically, which is very expensive, or you put pesticides on it, which people don't wanna eat, or you put in a genetically modified gene. One of those things you gotta do if you wanna eat corn. So farmers decided to go with genetically modified uh, because it does not contain pesticides and it allows the corn to be inexpensive. Okay, this is called golden rice. Now, normally rice is white. Why is it golden? Because it contains the gene for beta carotene. Now, the term carotene comes from carrots, and that's what makes carrots orange. Beta carotene is necessary to help you with your vision for producing vitamin A, the need for your retina. So the question is, why put beta carotene that we use to make vitamin A in rice? Well, here's the deal. If you want to get this to people who really need it in foreign countries, shipping carrots is really difficult to do. Why? Because carrots are generally uh, difficult to preserve. Uh, you can freeze them, but then you have to keep them frozen the whole time that you're shipping them. You can can them, I guess, but they lose a lot of their nutrients. So sending carrots to a foreign country to help people with their health is not the best way to do it. But rice, is a, especially dry rice, is a, a, a very easy and cost-effective way to feed people in other countries. So if you put the gene for beta carotene in the rice, then you just ship a big bag of rice to these folks who need it, and it's a lot less expensive, and they still get the beta carotene they need, and you can help them with their vision. All right, a little bit more FYI, golden rice Version two, transgenic variety of rice that contains genes from both daffodils and corn could help prevent vitamin A deficiency and resulting blindness. If you don't get enough vitamin A, you may not be able to develop your vision properly. Okay, farm animals versus farm animals. Look at the word farm as in pharmacy. While genetically 
Modified plants are used today in commercial products. Transgenic whole animals are currently only in the testing phase. I checked this recently, and yes, uh, genetically modified cattle, pigs, and sheep are not really part of our food, uh, our food uh, um, supply. So they're still uh, not not ready. FDA is still not ready to to have them um, part of our food supply. These transgenic sheep carry a gene for the human for a human blood protein that can help treat cystic fibrosis. So for example, you take their milk or you take their blood and you extract this protein, it could help people with cystic fibrosis treat their disease. GM uh, animals are not yet used for food. So they're not part of our food supply yet. Now you can give animals uh, hormones, for example, to help them grow faster, but genetically modified animals are still really not part of, a, of our food supply. Okay, more about farm animals. A transgenic pig has been produced that carries a gene for human hemoglobin, which then you could use for blood transfusion. The idea is you could have the synthetic blood with actual human hemoglobin in it. Uh, synthetic blood has, has, has a long history. You could read about it if you're interested, but having molecules that carry oxygen has been somewhat unsuccessful. Hemoglobin is still the most useful molecule for carrying oxygen. So the problem is not a lot of people donate blood, not enough people donate blood. So what if you could get pigs to produce this hemoglobin, human hemoglobin, and make that into artificial blood, and uh, you could save a lot of lives that way. Anyway, there you go. In 2006, genetically modified pigs carried roundworm genes that produce proteins that convert less healthy fatty acids to omega-3 fatty acids. Now, if you've ever heard about any of this, omega-3 fatty acids are necessary for the development of neurons like in your brain. So, for example, if you eat animal fat, which can lead to plaques in your arteries, especially in your lungs and heart, theoretically, this protein that you would take as a supplement would convert those unhealthy trans fats or saturated fats into omega-3 fatty acids, which would help your brain develop. So that might be a good supplement to take. Okay, so this is a this is a review question, folks. What are the workhorses of modern biotechnology? And the answer is not horses, it's bacteria. Bacteria do the work, as you've seen from this lecture. Bacteria are the main things that you use to do this process of copying genes and making proteins in large quantity. To work with genes in the laboratory, biologists often use bacterial plasmids. So what is a plasmid? Well, I mentioned bacterial chromosomes are circular, right? Well, a plasmid is like a little mini chromosome that sits off to the side. In the same way that your phone has an operating system and apps, these plasmids are kind of like apps. They're smaller, they're easier to move, the bacteria will readily take them up because they, they know instinctively that there might be something in this little plasmid that could help me survive. Plasmids are small circular DNA molecules. They're separate from the much larger, larger bacterial chromosome. So the larger bacterial chromosome does the main work of the bacterium of forming it. But all these plasmids do things like, hey, I might be able to resist an antibiotic, or I might be able to live in this environment better if I have this little mini piece of DNA that gives me an advantage. So if we look at an exploded bacterium, and they can do these processes that call, cause the bacterium to squirt its DNA out you see that the vast majority of this DNA is the single long, long bacterial chromosome. But here you see these things which are called plasmids, the separate pieces of DNA that do very specific jobs. Okay, plasmids carry easily incorporate foreign DNA. So you can break into these plasmids, put in a chromosome, and put in a gene, and then the bacterium will suck up that plasmid and then make it part of its normal genetic signature. Plasmids are readily taken up by the bacterial cells, so they suck them up because it can be useful. Plasmids then act as vectors. A vector is anything that moves something from one place to the other. In this case, you're moving DNA or a gene from one place into the bacterium. Okay, so this is how it works. I'm not going to show this. It doesn't really work very well. Anyway, so how does it work? Recombinant DNA techniques can help biologists produce large quantities of a desired protein. So for example, you take three different bacterial plasmids, incorporate three different genes, you put each of them into a separate bacterial line, 
And then whichever one of them produces the desired protein, well, we're going to isolate that bacterium and grow it in large quantities. This figure will not likely be on the test, so don't worry about it. I will not be asking you to tell me how this all works. Okay, moving on. DNA fingerprinting and forensic science. DNA technology has rapidly revolutionized the field of forensic. Forensics is basically the scientific analysis of evidence from crime scenes. So you guys probably all seen the show CSI. There's different CSIs, right? But the idea is, my favorite right now is CSI Las Vegas. I really like Las Vegas. But the idea is that you come on a crime scene and then there's microscopic evidence that you would gather and run through machines or whatever to figure out what happened during the crime. DNA fingerprinting can be used to determine whether two samples of genetic material are from the same individual. That's all they really do. So for example, you find blood somewhere, you check the genetic signature, you gain DNA from a potential suspect or somebody of interest, and you compare them and say, are they the same? Now, if the blood found at the scene matches this person, what it says is they bled at the scene. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're guilty of a crime or they bled on the day of the crime. It just means their blood was found at the crime scene. That's it. Or their hair was found or saliva was found, something like that, at the crime scene. Okay, so I might ask you, what is this figure showing? So here's how it works. At the top left, we have a blood sample. We take out the DNA from the blood, basically just to let you guys know, white blood cells are the only cells that contain DNA in blood. Because there's so little of it, you replicate it, you cause, you use a polymerase chain reaction to make lots and lots of copies. And then you cut the DNA into chunks. Each of the chunks has a particular size and weight. All the chunks of a particular size and weight will go into these little bands, and I'll show you how this works later. So for example, this person has a particular signature of bands of DNA chunks that form this way. When you put the DNA on top and run an electrical current through this gel, it separates them out in the same way that if you put dirt into a river, it would separate the different size particles from rocks down to silt. Now, what you can say is we have two different individuals that have their DNA. And when we do the exact same process, which person matches? Well, um, uh, Hold on a second, Dave. Uh, folks, I need to respond to something really quick. All right, back to it. Had to take care of something real quick. Okay, so how does it work? You collect the DNA from the crime scene and from the suspects. DNA is amplified if necessary. For example, if there's not enough DNA in the sample, you replicate it, and then you run it through a gel. You cut it into fragments. So what does this say? The DNA fragments are compared. So what does it say? It says that suspect two their DNA matches the DNA that was found at the crime scene. That's all that it does. It's usually a pretty good example of um, if somebody claims that they weren't there and you find it there, then, um, then it does show that they were there and they were lying about not being there unless there's some su suspicion that the person's DNA was planted at the crime scene. This is what happens with o, what happened with O.J. Simpson back in 1995, a fairly famous uh, example of potential uh, misuse of police uh, evidence. Again. All right. Murder, paternity, and ancient DNA, the first case. All right. Back in 1983 and back in 86, young girls were raped and murdered near Narborough, England. So they were very much interested, or as they would say in England, keen on finding this man who did this. Now we assume it was a man because, you know, obviously. Okay, so normally what they would do is they would gather some samples, let's first say, for example, semen from the bodies of the rape victims and murder victims. 
But the only thing they'd really be able to get back in those days was blood type. Now, you know, there's lots and lots of blood types, and there's lots of people that have the same blood type. So you can't really nail down exactly who it is who left the semen sample, you know, before this time. So the killer left behind few clues except for semen. So a man confessed to the second murder, but denied committing the first. So you would think, oh, we got him, right? Because he confessed. Not necessarily. It turns out that people will confess to crimes that they did not commit under duress because they will pretty much admit to anything if they're being pressed hard enough by people who are questioning them, especially if they don't have legal representation with them. So it's not necessarily the case that just because he confessed, he was guilty. The police turned to a professor who had recently developed the first DNA fingerprint identification system. This was back in the 80s. He compared DNA from the samples collected at both murder scenes and concluded that both murders had been committed by the same killer. So we got him, right? He, co he confessed to one, but denied the other one, so we must have him, right? Not necessarily. What they found is DNA from the suspect did not match either crime scene. So why did he confess? He was under duress. He was, now in television and movies, often someone's trying to protect somebody else, and that, that could be the case. But in this case, they had intimidated him and pressured him into confessing when he was innocent. The case was finally broken using DNA fingerprinting and killer was brought to justice. So they found the actual killer, ran his DNA, bingo, it maps the semen inside the girl's and he was thrown in jail. Okay, now this is an interesting picture because this is Dr. Henry Lee. He became quite famous back in 95 uh, because of his involvement with the O.J. Simpson case. I don't know how familiar you guys are with the O.J. Simpson murder case. His wife and her, I guess, boyfriend were murdered, and uh, O.J. Simpson's blood was found at the crime scene. And so Dr. Henry Lee got on the stand, and this was a public trial, by the way, a public murder trial, very rare, still very a very rare thing. And so people were able to watch how this all went down. And he talked about how DNA fingerprinting was used to determine that that blood at the crime scene actually belonged to O.J. Simpson. Since its introduction in 1986, DNA fingerprinting has become a standard part of law enforcement. This type of evidence has been used in many cases. So many, many cases, especially think about CSI, uh, they run DNA fingerprinting and they can determine down to 99.999% probability who left that those cells there. Now, here's an interesting point here. It says here can prove innocence or guilt. Not necessarily. The only thing that it does is it says, does the sample A match suspect B or, su you know, sample X match suspect A. If that matches, it means that your DNA or that suspect's DNA was found at the crime scene or planted at the crime scene. Now, one of the things with OJ Simpson is there was this belief that, uh, that one of the police investigators had actually moved or acquired some of OJ Simpson's blood and put it at the crime scene to implicate him. Now, one of the things that gave that, that supported that is racist stuff was found in this cop's locker. So it made it difficult to say that he was completely impartial. Now, did he do it? Well, O.J. Simpson basically admitted to it after he was acquitted or found innocent in a book that said, if I had done it, basically walked down all the things that he did. Uh, but uh, in in United States, double jeopardy means you can't be tried a second time for the same crime. So once he was found innocent, by the way, he, he got out of it, I think, because he had really good lawyers who found loopholes and made the prosecutors trip up on their own evidence and made some pretty serious errors. What's interesting is if you want to know whether people think he's innocent or guilty, you have to talk to different groups of people, for example, African-Americans. Over, overall, uh, more than, than not think he was innocent, whereas non-African-American communities tend to think he was guilty. So perspective can have a big impact on guilt or innocence in a court of law. Okay, identifying remains. Uh, basically, if you find a dead body, can you tell anything about their DNA? Now, back in 2001, the victims of the World Trade Center attack 
um, they use genetic fingerprinting because uh, normally to identify a body, you would use fingerprints or dental records. Well, because of the, the extreme violence uh, and the destruction that came with the falling of those towers, sometimes all you had was just a little teeny bit of tissue. So there weren't any teeth, there weren't any fingerprints. So that little bit of tissue had to be compared either to samples that medical profession professionals had, or what they would do is compare it to known um, relatives. So for example, mom, dad, brother, and sister, if the DNA that was found in the World Trade Center matches this family's profile, then you can say, yeah, that's him. He unfortunately passed away in this. Um, an evolution research technique has been used to study ancient pieces of such as the Iceman found in Italy and Egyptian mummies. So they were able to track down who the descendants of King Tut were using DNA found in King Tut's mummy. In addition, this guy was found in the Alps, had been dead thousands of years. They were able to find out much about his DNA. And um, I used to talk about this a lot more. I'm going to go ahead and move on. Okay, PCR, polymerase chain reaction. It's a technique by which any segment of DNA can be amplified or cloned. And we saw that earlier. You have a little bit of blood. Now you need a lot of DNA so you can run it through that um, gel electrophoresis. Through polymerase chain reaction, scientists can obtain enough DNA from even minute. Please note this is minute, which means very small, not minute. It's spelled the same, pronounced differently minute amounts of blood or other tissue to allow for DNA for fingerprinting. For example, one eyelash could be enough, the base of which has living cells in it, amplify the DNA. You can tell whose eyelash that belongs to. This is how it works. Here's the initial DNA segment. You separate it into two pieces. You bring in the complementary bases, the opposite bases. You continue to do that over and over again. And pretty soon you have lots and lots of identical copies of the original DNA. DNA amplification by polymerase chain reaction. DNA fingerprinting. Okay, how to do it. So I, I alluded to it a little bit before. First, DNA is broken up into fragments using enzymes. And all of the pieces are broken up into this, uh, not all of them, but the DNA is broken up into similar sized chunks. So if you have lots and lots of copies of the DNA, a particular section will have a particular size on all of the chromosomes. When you mix all those chunks together, how do you separate them into bands? Well, you, um, you do this, hold on a second, folks. You do this system by which you put it into these wells and then you run electricity through it. Now, it turns out that the larger, heavier chunks are gonna move more slowly through this gel and the smaller, lighter chunks are gonna move more quickly. And so do any of them match? Well, you might think the top two are similar, but they have to match every single band. So there's actually um, three separate people here. Even though they look similar, they have to match all the bands to be identical. So the idea is the smaller bands will move to the bottom because they move more quickly and the larger bands stay up at the top. And it's kind of like what would happen if you dump dirt into a river, the big chunks would stay right there where you dumped them. The smaller chunks would move somewhat down and then the sand and silt would go down to the end of the river. And that's why you usually find towards the end of a river where it kind of peters out into the sand, the sand and the silt, whereas the rocks and boulders and pebbles are closer to where the water was moving more quickly. All right, so DNA fragments are visualized as bands on the gel. So you can see the suspect DNA and crime scene DNA. This suspect does not match the crime scene DNA, but that does not mean they are innocent or guilty. It just means it doesn't match. The bands of different DNA samples can then be compared. Is the suspect guilty? Well, based on this evidence, no, but there's lots of other bits of evidence that could be there. For example, uh, if the, there's DNA at the crime scene that doesn't match the suspect, it doesn't mean the suspect is innocent. It just means that particular sample could have been from somebody else who was there, uh, another criminal, another uh, accomplice, or just some other person. All right, so this is a little bit more FYI stuff. Begun in 1990, the Human Genome Project was a massive scientific endeavor to determine the nucleotide sequence of all the DNA in the human genome and identify the location of sequence of every gene, and they've done that since then. At the completion of the project, more than 99 percent of the genome had been determined to a basically 100% accuracy. 
3 billion nucleotide pairs are identified, 21,000 genes were found. And by the way, this is the foundation of the company, two companies now that have now merged together uh, called 23andMe. Now, 23andMe has merged with a company called Ancestry.com. And what it does is basically, if you send in a sample, they check all your genes to say, hey, you have these particular genes and pairing with Ancestry.com means based on your genetic profile, your family came from this country and came to the United States this long ago. Uh, if you're Native American, that would be a long, long time ago, potentially. But for most European Americans, they can track down where your family came from, what part of Europe or Asia or whatever, Africa. And uh, that's why those two companies now work together. <clears throat> Human Genome Project can map genes for specific diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And this is what you would, you would find out if you did the 23andMe. They would find out, are you likely to get Alzheimer's in old age or Parkinson's? Now, this is Muhammad Ali and Michael J. Fox, both who suffer, suffer from Parkinson's. Muhammad Ali passed away recently. Michael J. Fox is still battling the disease. Okay, that is it. Let's see. How do I get out of this? Am I still, uh, what am I doing here? Ah, here we go. Okay, so now, now I am not sharing. Okay, do either of you have any questions about that particular um, presentation, anything in it? Yes, good. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to um, 10B. And we will do that, and then we'll call it a day. OK. So human gene therapy and genetically modified organisms. So we're basically continuing uh, with, uh, let's see, why am I not seeing us? Hold on a second. Hmm. Ah, let's see. There we go. Okay, I just want to make sure I can see myself and see you guys. Let's see what we got here. All right, I'm still working on it. Give me a moment. All right, here we go. Human gene therapies and GMOs. Off we go. Human gene therapy. Human gene therapy is a procedure that seeks to treat disease by altering the genes of the afflicted person. There are many traits in the human genome that are genetic uh, diseases. And theoretically, if you took out the genes of the person who's suffering and put in healthy genes in their place, they would no longer have that genetic disease. Um, it's difficult, it's very difficult to do, but this is the procedure. Normal human gene is isolated and cloned, so you get lots of copies of the normal gene. A non-harmful harmful virus, which is a vector, remember vector moves, moves something from one place, which would be a test tube, into the person used to transfer the new genes. The virus is injected into the patient, and the new DNA is incorporated into the patient's DNA. This is the most difficult thing. These first few steps are fairly easy to do technologically. But when you inject a virus into a person, then that virus has to find every single afflicted cell, inject its DNA, and then break into the human chromosome, put in the normal gene, and do so in a way that's not going to cause cancer. Now, this is very difficult to do because the human genome has many safeguards against this happening. Viruses are trying to do this all the time. So we have safeguards over millions of years of evolution that prevent this from happening. So it's a very difficult step to get the DNA incorporated into the unhealthy individual. The patient then to begins to produce normal proteins. This is ideally how it would work, very difficult to make it happen. So this is how it would work. So this is a healthy individual, kind of a hippie, but um, by the way, this is the, the uh, author of the previous textbook that I used to use, Campbell. Anyway, um, 
The normal human gene is isolated and cloned. So he's a normal individual. This is his normal gene. So we clip it out. We put it into the DNA in a virus, which is the vector. The human gene is inserted into the virus. The virus contains the normal human gene. And then the virus is injected into the patient. The gene breaks its way into the cells that are affected. And now the person is healed. Now, by the way, this could be the second half of a figure. If you guys remember, I talked to you guys about the corn and, and heart attack therapy figure from earlier in the lecture. Now, if that figure is there, this one would be right next to it. And I would ask you to compare and contrast these two. So it's a, it's a challenging essay, but I would ask you, how are they similar and different? So you want to talk about each of these figures, what it's showing and how they're similar and different. That's how you're going to get your five points. Okay. So this is how uh, human gene therapy is supposed to work. All right. Can you do that? Well, you wouldn't have to fill it in, but you would have to explain it because this is online. When I used to give this as a paper test that people, my students would have to fill it in and then explain it. Okay. S severe combined immunodeficiency, sometimes called SID or SIDS. There's an S at the end for syndrome, a whole series of problems associated with this. So it's a uh, fatal inherited uh, characteristic by a defective gene. So the gene prevents the development of the immune system. Now you have to have an immune system to survive, People who don't have it are often isolated uh, from all kinds of potential uh, pathogens. And there was a movie made decades ago called uh, Bubble, uh, Boy in the Bubble. John Travolta, believe it or not, who's still around, played the boy in the bubble. Now, in the 90s, there was a kind of a silly movie called Bubble Boy, had Jake Gyllenhaal in it. Um, he had an immune system, but um, his mother tried to convince him he didn't, so he wouldn't leave home. Anyway. It's called bubble boy syndrome. SIDS patients quickly die unless treated with a bone marrow transplant, or they have to be completely isolated. Human gene therapy has been used to treat people suffering from SCID. In the year 2000, two infants suffering from SCID were provided with functional copies of their defective genes. Did it work? Well, the SCID study was halted in 2002 after two patients developed leukemia like symptoms. Not good. So since then, some developments have happened in the SCID, but nothing uh, significant yet. Some uh, human gene therapy has been successfully done, but it's kind of hit and miss. Okay, safety and ethical issues. Now, if you're changing the genes in people and in food, is that safe? Is it a good idea? That's what we mean by this. As soon as scientists realized the power of DNA technology, they began to worry about potential dangers. One of my favorite movies is Jurassic Park. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but one of the great lines from it is uh, Jeff Goldblum's character, who's the, who's the uh, physicist, the chaos theorist. He says, they were so busy trying to figure out whether they could do this, they never stopped to think about whether they should. And it's a great line. Um, I think people often worry that scientists are more worried about whether they can do something rather than whether they should. Now, I think that's more likely to be the case for business and industry because they're driven by profit. Scientists aren't generally driven by profit. Uh, but you still have this idea that if you can make something happen, is that a good idea? Is it healthy? Is it, is it wise, et cetera? Do you create, so what could happen? We could create new pathogens. That is, you start messing around with the DNA, a bacterium becomes a super bug, and it wipes out everybody. There have been movies that have been made in the last 20 years where this dangerous new pathogen escapes and it kills most of the population and it's a post-apocalyptic disaster movie. Uh, Contagion uh, was one of those and Outbreak was another one that was like that. The transfer of cancer genes into infectious bacteria and viruses. By the way, you can get cancer from a virus. It's called HPV. You guys have heard of it? Genital wart HPV. So what they're starting to do now is vaccinate kids against it so they, they don't get HPV virus. Now, there has been some controversy about that because why would you give a vaccination to a kid way before they're going to have sexual contact? Well, you don't know when kids are going to have sexual contact. And uh, especially in females, it can lead to sterility and potentially uh, uh, cervical cancer and death. So what more progressive, 
parents are doing is starting to give these vaccines to their kids so that when they do start having sexual contact, you don't have to worry about the boys giving it. So you give it to the boys so they don't spread it to the girls and the girls don't pick it up and pick up cervical cancer. So HPV uh, vaccination is a more common thing. Uh, people who are fearful of vaccines or think that their kids would never have sex before they got married, which is not true in most cases, but they would resist this vaccine. Okay, so this shows a uh, scientist working on a potentially dangerous uh, microorganism. So what scientists do is they develop strict laboratory protocols that really are there to prevent uh, these potentially dangerous organisms from getting out into the environment. Now, a movie that came long ago, it was, uh, oh, what was the name of that? It was Stephen, Stephen King. And uh, can anybody remember the name of that movie? It was redone recently. Oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of the movie. But in this movie, people are working like this in a laboratory. The, the bug somehow gets out. And before they're able to shut down the military base, they drive off and spread it. And it becomes, um, it becomes, it kills most of the people in the world. And the only people left are the ones that happen to have immunity against it. Uh, the, the, ah, what was the name of that movie? Anyway, so in reality, life is not a movie. If this guy somehow got exposed, for example, he cut himself and the bacteria or virus got into him, he would not do like the character did in the movie, which is run away. And he would do this for two main reasons. First, he would have ethics and morality that would say, if I just run away from this, I'm going to end up spreading it to all these innocent people, and they are trained not to do this. Secondly, the one place that you could best get treated for this organism would be this very lab because they understand it the best. So the idea that a scientist would run out of the laboratory and infect everybody is really not very realistic, but people love to blame scientists because they are different from the average American. They have a lot of power. They're kind of nerds. I don't know, but they tend to be not trusted very much by the general public populace. It was called The Stand. The Stand was the movie about <clears throat> Stephen King, about this uh, organism getting out and killing most of the people. Anyway, more about controversies. Genetically modified strains account for a significant pe uh, percentage of several agricultural crops. The United States, as I mentioned, about 50% of corn and more than three quarters of soybeans are genetically modified. Now, in 1999, controversy over the safety of these foods prompted protests throughout Europe. The sign says, GMOs, no thank you, yes to biodiversity. So Europe pretty much resists genetically modified organisms. The United States embraces it. So that's part of the reason why we don't ship a lot of corn and soybeans over to Europe. Okay, advocates of a cautious approach have two primary concerns. Now, what they're saying is, don't stop genetically modified organism because you can't. But what should we do to make sure it's safe? Well, one of the concerns is what if genes from the genetically modified corn end up out in wild species, causing problems for them, causing them to go extinct? That's a problem if you care about the environment. Second could be that genetically modified foods are unsafe for people, could cause cancer or other health effects. Uh, because they haven't been around that long, we don't know for sure uh, what exactly they do. But for me, I would rather eat corn that's genetically modified than corn carrying pesticides, because they're pretty sure that pesticides are unsafe and harmful, but they're not certain about what genetically modified organisms will do. If when I ask most of my students, is it a good idea to change the genes inside of an organism, most people say no, because they're fearful of change. They're, they don't understand it, they don't understand the process, so they think it's a bad idea. But the analogy that I want to give you is the question, is genetically modifying organisms a good idea or not? Then you have to ask the question, is splitting the atom a good idea? Well, splitting the atom gave rise to atom bombs, which ended the Second World War, not in a good way, because it killed millions or thousands of innocent people in Japan. <clears throat> but we also split the atom to get fairly clean uh, energy. So the, the question is, is something like splitting an atom or genetically modifying something or creating vaccines, is it safe or not? It all comes down to how you use it. And if you use something in a responsible way with lots of regulation, then it's gonna be safer than if you just do it however. So 
for both nuclear energy and vaccines and genetically modified organisms, whether it's safe or not, completely depends on how you do it. Okay. <clears throat> Negotiated from 130 countries, including the United States, agreed on a thing called the Biosafety Protocol, which means that it requires exporters to identify genetically modified organisms present in bulk food shipments. So if you're gonna send food from the United States to another country, you have to determine, you have to label, hey, is this genetically modified? And a lot of countries don't want it. For example, they said they tried to send genetically modified corn to an African country a while back, and that African country was selling much of their corn to, um, to Europe. Europe does not want genetically modified organisms. And what the African country said to the United States is, could you please grind it up first so that farmers don't plant it and ruin our ability to say we're GMO free? The United States said, no, we're not going to grind it up for you. Uh, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. And so the African country re rejected it and said, we don't want it. So that's an interesting controversy. Several U.S. regulatory agencies evaluate biotechnology projects for potential risks. So they look at it. For example, the Department of Agriculture, that's primarily responsible for determining what farmers do. Is it a good idea helping farmers, making sure they're making good choices? Food and Drug Administration determines whether food that we consume and drugs that we take are safe. Environmental Protection Agency is the environment being protected, not just farming environment, but the overall environment. And last but not least, International Institutes of Health, which protect us against pandemics. And they didn't really do their job as well as they could have uh, with COVID, uh, partly because the administration at the time didn't give them all the tools that they needed to do it. Anyway, that's politics again, but these are the, the different uh, government agencies that help keep our environment and food safe. Okay, ethical questions based by biotechnology. So for example, what if this girl is four feet tall and a normal height for a girl in this family or of this age would be five feet tall. Is it ethical to give her human growth hormone to get her back to normal, what we would call normal? Well, that's an ethical question, isn't it, right? We can do it. They have genetically modified organisms producing human growth hormones, but if she was born to be four feet tall, does giving her human growth hormone, getting her to five feet or five, five or whatever, is that ethical to give to her? And that, that's something that is controversial. Should genetically engineered human growth hormone be used to stimulate growth in HGH deficient children? Is it a disease? Well, I would say no, it's not. But people who are really, really under normal height often are discriminated against. So is it fair to withhold that from them when they could be more normal? And the question is, is normal important? These are all ethical questions that individual families have to wrestle with. Okay, genetic engineering of gametes and zygotes has been accomplished in lab animals. Now, a, a scientist recently in China claimed to have done it with human beings, but his research was it hasn't been replicated or validated, so we don't know for sure. I'm guessing it's been done because if they can do it with mice, the genome of a mouse is not that different from us. Believe it or not, the basic biology of a mouse and the basic biology of a human are similar. Now, how do we know this? We use mice to test drugs that will eventually end up being used on humans. That's why they're called a lab rat, right? If the biology of our mouse or a rat were significantly different than ours, we couldn't use them to test medicines or other uh, therapeutic uh, processes. So if you can genetically modify a mouse to contain a gene for glowing in the dark from a jellyfish, which they have, and when you have the babies, which are called pinkies, and you turn off the lights, these genetically modified mice glow in the dark, which might be kind of handy, but is mostly just a kind of like, uh huh, that's kind of cool. Interesting, we can do that. So could you do that in people? Probably. Would you want to have your genes changed with other organisms or modified in a way that would make you better? Well, there's a movie that came out back in 99 called Gattaca, which was all about that. So if you're interested, watch the movie Gattaca. And it basically talks about all the potential problems that could come from somebody. Um, and by the way, we may end up watching that movie in lab because we are doing uh, in-person lab still. I might, I might show that movie um, and have you guys write a lab report about it. <clears throat> all right. Should we interfere in evolution this way? Well, 
it depends on what kind of a person you are. If you believe that that technology is the way to go, we can fix problems and we should, uh, then you would say yes. And if you're a person who says, no, we shouldn't be messing with science and playing God, so to speak, then you'd probably say no. And often it comes down to, believe it or not, even culture of political ties. Advances in genetic fingerprints raise privacy issues. And we're going to be seeing some of that in that movie called Gattaca. But the question is, uh, would you give your genetic fingerprint to an insurance company, to a doctor, to a hospital, to the DMV? Okay, well, let's, go, let's go through each of these. Well, I think fairly soon, in the next five to 10 years, doctors are going to start demanding that their patients give their DNA for a genetic fingerprint. And why would they do this? Well, it turns out that not everybody is the same. Wow, go figure, right? Not everybody's biology is the same. When they develop cures, medicines for disease, it doesn't work the same on every person. Now, it turns out since genetic fingerprinting, companies that produce medicines can produce different versions of them. So for example, if my genetic fingerprint suggests that I would do best with medicine version A, and my fiance's genetic profile says that she would do better with version B, I wouldn't want to get version B and she wouldn't want to get version A. So if the doctor had my genetic fingerprint, they would say, well, based on your genetic fingerprint, we're going to give you medicine A and not B, and vice versa for my fiance. So doctors are going to say, hey, look, if you want to, if you want to get treated well, or if you even want to be my patient, I need to know your genetic fingerprint so that I can treat you more effectively. And the question is, would the insurance companies pay for this? I would suggest that they would. And let me give you an example. About 17 years ago, I got a vasectomy, which is, means I can't have any more kids. And my insurance company paid for every penny of it. Now, why would they do this? Well, what is more expensive, a vasectomy or five babies, which I could potentially have for the rest of my time with this insurance company? Babies are really, really expensive. So the insurance company said, sure, we'll, we'll get your tubes tight. And they paid for every penny because they knew that it would save them money in the long run. So the question is, how would paying for a genetically uh, a genetic fingerprinting test save the insurance company money if it costs a few hundred dollars? Well, every time a person, every day a person stays in the hospital, it costs the insurance company a ton of money. So if they can get people in and out quickly, it costs them a lot less money. How do they get people in and out quickly? Well, you make sure that the medicine they're getting is tailored for their particular biology. And how do you do that? You have to know their genetic fingerprint. So I think what's gonna happen is the insurance company will say, well, you gotta get your fingerprint done. And the doctor will say, you gotta get your fingerprint done. And the hospital will say the same thing. And patients will say, oh, okay, fine. I don't wanna be in the hospital for a week. I'd rather be out in a day. And so they will do it. How will you protect that information in the same way we protect uh, medical information? It's called HIPAA, MMR, medical, uh, medical records, uh, something, digital medical records. What, anyway, so those are protected under HIPAA, which means that you can't share it uh, with, that, with other people. But the question is, would you give it to the DMV? I think you would. And this is the evidence for that. Back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, the only people who ever got fingerprinted were people who had been arrested for a crime. The average American did not get fingerprinted because that was like a, a sign that you had been arrested for something. Well, they started requiring fingerprints for driver's licenses a few decades ago. And people went ahead and did it. They were like, well, I guess if that's the only way to get a driver's license, that's what I'll do. But if you talk to people 50 years ago, they'd be like, oh, hell no, I'm not going to give my fingerprint. Only Thieves and criminals do that. So if you think, no, I would never give my DM, the DMV my genetic fingerprint, well, you already gave them your thumbprint to get your driver's license. I think you would give them your genetic fingerprint. Who would they give it to? FBI and other national databases. So that if they found DNA at a crime scene, they would go right to you and arrest you at your house. So could this be used to discriminate against you in jobs or whatever, potentially, but I think it's coming. I think the DMV is going to ask people for a cheek swab to get a driver's license in the next five years. And people will do it because in the same way they did the fingerprint in the past. <clears throat> because 
In that way, if a fingerprint was found at a crime scene, they wouldn't have to gather suspects and fingerprint them. They could go right to you because they already have your fingerprint because you have a driver's license. Made law enforcement way easier. And so this is just an extension of that. I think it's going to happen. What about information obtained in the Human Genome Project 23andMe? Could 23andMe be hacked? Well, I'll tell you, one of the reasons why 23andMe is so cheap, believe it or not, it's really cheap, is that they sell your genetic information to pharmaceutical companies. Now, it doesn't, they claim it doesn't have your name attached to it. They sell it as a bulk, like these are all the people that have this particular gene. Now, why would the pharmaceutical industry want to know all the information from 23andMe? Well, if they know a particular number of people have a particular gene, they can start tailoring their medicines so that um, they can sell more medicine, sell better medicine to patients because they know that people are going to be entering hospitals with these particular genes. And that's how 23andMe and Ancestry is able to charge such small amounts as they sell your genetic information to the pharmaceutical industries. And you have to agree to that to get the deal on that. That thing. How do we prevent genetic information from being used in a discriminatory manner? Well, there have to be strong safeguards, regulations, which some people hate, regulations, but that's how you keep things safe, is you make sure or try to make sure that this information doesn't get stolen. Well, we all know that passwords and key information can be stolen online. This could be stolen too. It just has to be better safeguarded in the same way we try to safeguard our information online. Okay. So that is it for today. Um, let's see if I can. Okay. Uh, do either of you have any? I, I want to thank you for coming, by the way. Do either of you have any questions uh, about what I covered today or what's coming up this week? Okay. Well, thank you for coming to the lecture. I hope to see you on Monday for lab. Um, complete all the work that's in this module. Do your best. And um, do we have a test this week? Is there a test in this module? Well, anyway, if we did have a test, we should have covered it, gone over it in lab. But anyway, uh, finish whatever has been assigned. I hope to see you on Monday in lab. Have a great weekend, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye.